Hello one and all, welcome to a Galaxy Man Show interview show. So today's guest is this incredible actor known by the name of Noah Huntley. Uh, he's in this uh, incredible series called Pandora. Uh, so I'm about to give him an add into the live now and have a chat with Noah. So here we go. Hey Noah, what's up? Hey. Uh, uh, so I've come. Uh, I've come to the like, only area in Dorset where there seems to be a mast right beside me. There. Oh well. <laughs> so that um, so that I could cancel that out it was like maybe the issue why we weren't able to connect. But I'm uh, yeah. I'm glad I can see you and hear you now. Okay. Yes. Thank yeah. God. <laughs> well, thank you for coming onto my show. By the way, it's such a pleasure having you on my show. Uh, so. For people that don't know who you are, I'll get you to introduce yourself and explain a bit about what you do, uh, and then we'll dive right into the questions. Yeah, cool. So my name's Noah Huntley. I'm a British-born actor. I've been sort of between here and America for the last 10, 15 years. And um, I've been shooting a series called Pandora, a sci-fi series, which is in its second season. We just finished two uh, in Bulgaria during COVID, um, which was quite an accomplishment. And I arrived home two days ago. And uh, we'd spoken, and finally we get to to meet. So that's my story. Awesome. So we'll dive right into the questions now. Noah. So with my first question, what was it like shooting season one of Pandora and getting to play the uncle of uh, Jax? Uh, and yeah. It was a little bit nerve-wracking season one because they had some vague ideas, or at least Mark has been a sort of Star Trek nerd for about well, all his life and written two books on Star Trek and has got this sort of kind of slightly geeky sci-fi take on everything. But th those ideas weren't really coalesced fully, and there wasn't really a clear idea about anything, really, in season one. But we all kind of uh, researched around what we thought he was getting at and kind of presented that, and season one became a sort of presentation of possibilities. And uh, so, But he'd always had me down as a character who was just sort of... Um, uh, quite old school, quite conservative, quite distant. And I was trying to kind of bring a slightly more youthful edge to him so that he became more sort of Harrison Ford in Raiders of the Lost Ark, moving into Star Wars The Millennium Falcon than kind of uh, the paper chase that I think Mark had me researching for kind of uh, inspa in the, early, in the early days. Awesome. So, can I just say, Noah, uh, you actually play the role of uh, Professor Osborne incredibly. Um, as soon as I saw um, Pandora season one, I was like, wow, like, you are such a brilliant actor uh, mm -hmm. and such a brilliant person. So, I just want to say, you pull off the role as Professor Osborne amazingly. So, uh, on my next question, what, yeah. what was your favourite um, What was your favorite memorable scene uh, to shoot from season one? Uh, you know, in some, in some ways it was the first scene we ever shot just because there were so many unknowns and as, I mean, I hope what you're alluding to with Osborne, he, he had to be this character who had this sort of gravitas and this authority and I was anything but, I mean, I was kind of going, come on guys, somebody give me, give me some pointers and we were getting nothing. So I kind of had to take a very strong line on who he was and not apologize for his abruptness and his uh, lack of emotional empathy and all of these things which fundamentally could lead you down a rabbit hole because you're, you're left kind of going, is this going to turn my character into a blatant narcissist? You know, is there, a, is there a reason that might be explained or is did Mark making this up on the hoof? And, uh, and so, so it was very, it, was, it would have been much easier to have taken a narrower route. So I did a lot of prep work up front. I got some ideas. I got to speak to Mark a few days beforehand, finally, after hounding him for a couple of weeks. And I said, here's all the research I've done. And I just showed him the timeline of every sci-fi movie I'd ever watched and every TV thing I'd ever known and every sci-fi thing I'd ever been in. And kind of went, this is where I'm placing it. Am I vaguely right? And um, I just think he's not used to necessarily dealing with people who have uh that that breadth of understanding or that ability maybe and and so uh, in the end he was very he welcomed it all but um it meant that that first scene where i meet jacks in the study 
um, which was a three pager and it was urgent, 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 urgent. Is he being nice to her? Is, is what agenda does she have? What does agenda does he know he, she has? What's his role as a professor? What's his role as um, the Earth Intelligence Service kind of head? And so there were all of these questions. And when that scene came out, I went, well, whatever all of that stuff was, it's on, it's on camera now. And so we kind of, that for me, it was very much like, okay, now we've, now we've started, now we've committed. And uh, from there on in, it started to get richer and richer. And that was sort of easier. But it was that first step that was the hard one on this one. Awesome. So for my next question, uh, with season two coming um, for, on October 4th, uh, what can people expect to see from Professor Osborne in season two? Well, I mean, I was, I, it was, uh, <laughs> there was a, there were a lot of um, surprises on season two and, um, but they're enriching in the end. And so Osborne was a guy who was, who was comfortable really because he was supported by the institutions, not only of the, the school, but also the military that he'd come from and also the intelligence service that he was a, a part of. And so he was kind of institutionalized. And I think that led to his emotional lack of emotional empathy. And in season two, that's completely turned on its head. And it becomes the season overall is, is much more mission based. We get away from the academy much more. We focused much more on the three central characters of Jax and Xander and Raylan, the Zatarian. And my everything really my my whole world as a professor as uh, in the intelligence service all the rest of it all of that is called into question and my power and authority are taken away and it's really down to my connection and um relationship with the the younger characters including jacks of course my niece that get me through season two and get me back on top because i'm basically um i'm basically attacked from all angles and uh, so, so it was quite, it was, it was fun to play, but with the nature of this thing, everything's quite last minute. So we're suddenly scrambling going, well, that changes everything. And it does change everything, but it's, um, I think it's more exciting. The production values are much higher. The relationships are, are much more, are much more uh, refined now. And the, and, and the world is much clearer. There are, there are several alien races that are explained very well now. So I think we're in a, I think we're in a good, we're in a good place. It looks, it looks incredible. Um, Max Meech, our DOP, and he's been directing his first episode on this one. And um, he's been, he's been absolutely extraordinarily valuable through this whole production. And uh, he continues to make it just look better and better. And the world is being built better and better by Mark. And I think the performance is better as well. Awesome. So for my next question, uh, why should people watch Pandora to people that haven't seen Pandora? Um, well, I think it's a fairly young demographic. It's young adult, which is kind of, I feel like it's 10 to 16 is kind of where we're hitting, but it's kind of racy from that point of view. So I'm not quite sure, like that's producer talk and that's not really my my thing but i think it's i think what i'm trying to say is it's accessible it's not something that's only it's not tenet it's not christopher nolan nolan so you're going to be sort of scratching your head every every two minutes or having to return to the theater and it's not uh it's not sort of trite in that it um it's um you know just just action adventures and good as goodies versus baddies you know there's there are actually some big questions that are being asked and presented in quite a gentle way. Um, and I think fundamentally it's an optimistic show. It's kind of outlook is optimistic. Um, and so often this kind of production would go into a dystopian, dystopian future. So um, I kind of, I kind of like that. Um, I guess I spoke with Narnia and Snow White. I've kind of had this element of kind of the fantastical that permeated a lot of my work. And this allows that to continue in the way that it connects to younger minded people, even if it isn't necessarily young people. It's, I, I think it's people who have a sort of, I don't know, for me, it's progressive and it's, um, it's presenting ideas in a, in a, in a gentle way, not in a kind of, you know, um, intellectually demanding way. 
which is sort of the province of scientists and people as they grow old and feel they have to legitimize everything with logic. And it's like, there's a lot of logic in this, but it's progressive metaphysical logic that's presented in a way that's readily available to, to the youngest of minds. So I, I really like that. So for my next question, uh, you, as you mentioned before, uh, with Snow White and the Huntsman, uh, where you play King Magnus, what was that experience like filming Snow White and the Huntsman? Well, I mean, that was that was the opposite in many ways. You know, we were shooting in the UK. It was universal um, that it was made for. There was a, a big budget. We're sort of talking 80 to 100 million budget on that. Um, so we had time and money. You know, what you're always trying to balance, whether in theatre, TV or film, traditionally, is, is, is money and time, and you usually don't have both. So in the theatre, you'd have time but not money. In TV, you'd have a bit of time and a bit of money. And in film, you have time and money. And that's sort of traditionally how things have broken down. And so Snow White was, was, was that for me. Um, and it was working with, with Kristen Stewart and um, Charlie Theron and, and Chris Hemsworth and some really cool Hollywood A-list, A-listers. And that was, that was great to do. This feels a bit more indie. Pan, from Pandora's point of view, although it's for an American network and it's uh, a CW show that, that they, re- they revere and have now in their second season, it's it's filmed in Eastern Europe and um, there are certain limitations with what we're able to do because of that. So um, I suppose that's a fundamental difference. Awesome. So for my next question, what was your favourite moment about playing Kid Magnus uh, that you could can remember? Being in bed with Charlie's. <laughs> no. Nah. Uh, you know. <laughs> uh, it was a great nightgown. <laughs> Actually, that w- it was a horrible scene to film. They had this enormous fire in this medieval bedroom. And uh, it was baking hot. And they had, you know, duvets upon duvets upon duvets with then wolfskin rugs and everything you could imagine so it was the it was the sweatiest it was the sweatiest mar- matrimonial bed scene that I, i've i've uh, ever ever imagined certainly been in and um so so yeah so that was probably that was probably the most memorable scene for me um i think we also you know i love horses and we we had these extraordinary kind of charges against the the dark army and uh, we were filming down in Bourne Wood where they shot Gladiator and it's sort of the Pinewood favourite, really. And um, we, we had uh, Steve Dent and his crew I've worked with a number of times now and, and uh, we'd spent a little bit of time getting to know the horses and then we had to do extraordinary battles with sort of 100 horses careening down this uh, wood out near Pinewood. And um, so those were, those were kind of fun to do too. And learning fight sequences as well. We had fight sequences that I've learned there. Was that Dracula? God, I can't even remember now. They all sort of blend into one. I'm on horses with a broadsword and either in bed with someone or uh, killing someone or both. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, that was my most memorable scene. <laughs> So for my next question, as you mentioned before, too, uh, that you were in uh, Chronicles of Narnia uh, and you played older Peter. What was that experience like for you? Uh, well, that was that was amazing for a number of reasons. I mean, it was 15 years ago now, but I, I was the first time I'd sort of um, been trained for several weeks beforehand to ride a horse. And I got to meet... Um, some really great actors on that and I totally fell in love with Sophie Winkleman and we ended up going out for two or three years together following that production so it, in a weird way it was personally more affecting than professionally although um, being part of the Narnia franchise is no bad thing um, and, and we were filming in New Zealand so we flew out to Australia I think for a moment and then flew out to Auckland waited did some rehearsals and then sort of two or so later moved down to Christchurch and started shooting down there so I mean it was probably one of the most glamorous jobs I've I've done you know I I had to do very little for the job we were treated incredibly well 
Um, we were filming the other side of the world in New Zealand that I'd never been to. I remember Margie now, our makeup um, supervisor, who was living in the Bay of Islands and talking about the, the, the Tasman and the, the two seas that meet anyway up there in the Bay of Islands. And uh, how she would watch whales as she was waiting for her prosthetic scars to heal. So uh, I think that was a kind of luxury job for me in a way. I just happened to kind of look a little bit like William Mosley. And so I ended up playing, playing him when he was crowned. So I got to be King Peter and he did all the grunt work. And then, uh, and then I, I met my uh, girlfriend there and, and had an amazing time in New Zealand. So it was kind of, it was one of those jobs. They don't happen that often. It's quite nice when they do. Awesome. So for my next question, what are the challenges uh, into the acting industry and how do you get through those challenges as a person? Uh, well, so, I mean, I think everyone deals with it differently, but I think the, the challenges getting in uh, are different to the challenges staying in. And I think that's changed from when I was growing up and when I was setting out to be an actor to now. So there's sort of four points to the question. In a way. I think when I was, when I was starting, you, you went to theatre school and, and that was that. There was no social media. Um, you got an agent and the agent submitted you and that was, that was what you did. Now I think there's much more onus on you to make sure that you're making connections with directors, writers, actors that you think are good, fostering those connections and that's almost expected. I, personally I don't do it, I'm kind of old school in that respect but I, and I start to do a bit of it now but it's not a, I don't have the social media business that's needed to do that. You know, in the early days of social media, I was just keen to try and keep some of my content um, private because I felt like social media was making me click step the whole time in a way that I wasn't comfortable with. And it basically meant that anything I uploaded was the property of someone else. It seemed unreasonable. So I set up my website, um, noahuntley.com, and that became my kind of landing site for all of the work that I accumulated over the last, probably the last 10 years. And so, so that's me. I don't know whether that's, I suppose that's sustaining a career in the industry, but, or that's an overview or a part of it. Um, I think getting in, it's still essential to have an agent. Um, it's, it's very hard to sell yourself in the industry. And you need somebody that's going to believe in the, the highs and the lows, and they become your therapist, your surrogate parent, your employer, your everything. So that's essential, I think. Um, and staying in it. I think I talked about it once before, but I think diversification is, is the buzzword really for all industries these days. And it's, it, it, it used to be that you could say, I'm an actor and, and that was that. And now it's like, well, you've got to be an actor with a view to writing or directing or producing, basically trying to be a proactive element of the industry rather than just reactive and hoping that somebody's going to see you or pluck you from a book of pictures and decide that you're the person to give the order. I think you I think you've got to be hungrier now than you were before um, and that's maybe a good thing you know it really emphasizes your intentions and if intent is is sort of the precursor to, to realization then I think you kind of you're being forced to actually commit in a way that in the past other people would make that commitment the sad thing is now with that though is that, um, you know, I think a, a lot of people are coming over here and going, great, if you're committed, then I'll pay you no money <laughs> to be part in, in my thing. And, and then you kind of have to draw a line and go, well, I, there's, you know, you have to work out what your level is, where that's, where that's acceptable and where it's not. Because otherwise you're going to end up doing a part-time job the whole time. And that's, uh, that's quite depressing. <laughs> awesome. So for my next question, uh, what have what have you learned about yourself during all this pandemic stuff? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, well, I mean, I think the thing we've all, I mean, I, I what have I learned about myself? I think I'm, I'm, I, I don't trust anything. <laughs> that's the first thing. I don't know if I trust mainstream media or politicians anymore, which is a fairly big thing admission. You know, I mean, when when that's the case, you just kind of think, well what can you trust? And I think that's a really valuable question. It's certainly a question I've asked myself. And 
you know, I've always been quite spiritually minded and I'm somebody that meditates regularly. And so I feel like this is time to go within rather than to obsess about what's on the outside, because what's in the outside world at the moment is either untrustworthy or is chaotic at best. And, um, and, I, and I'm not sure a little piece of fabric over my face is the solution to this thing that's responsible now for economic, global economic shutdown and breakdown. I went to France in amongst all this and wearing happily my bandana that I kind of tote around with me most of the time now. And they went, no, it's not okay. You have to wear a mask. And I said, well, I am wearing a mask. And he said, no, 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 it's not a surgical mask. And I, and I find myself going, well, it's okay in England. And also, how is a surgical mask better than this mask? So, and I, and in, and I didn't think that was, any of these things were actually uh, solvable in terms of their ability to do anything with a virus. So I think I've become much more scientifically looked into things with much more uh, scientific autonomy. And I don't trust what's out there because I think we're, we're fed such a lot of rubbish these days. And I think politics generally around the world in the last 10 years has become a, a, a shameful institution with a bunch of blithering idiots uh, running, running things. So I, how can you invest in that? So my feeling is, and my advice to anyone is, is, is go within and trust in that process. You know, there is a higher self that incorporates you and goes beyond you. And that's the thing to connect to. Um, because looking externally for the solution is is a is a is a lot of time and quite often a waste of time. Um, I know those are those are powerful words, but that's really how I feel about it. And I think it's I think it's been a powerful time in that respect in terms of coalescing people's uh, feelings as much as thoughts about these things. I should ask you. Sorry, I should ask you, Jacob. What's your uh, What's your take on it? Because I'm, I'm genuinely interested. I know everyone's going through their own individual experience, and I have a strong view on it. Yeah. But I'm, I'm not conceited or blind in my belief. I'm genuinely interested in what everyone's learning from this deeper level. Yeah. Well, I actually live in Australia. Um. It, so with art, like with the, us Australians, we don't have to wear masks or anything. Have I lost uh, you there? Which is odd. Uh, like, well, in part. Uh, yeah, it, so we uh, I live in Australia, so in parts of Australia we have to wear masks, but some like some parts of Australia we don't, uh, which is really crazy. Um, but my thoughts of this whole pandemic stuff, I think people are just trying to get out there again and just get get out back into life again. But um, they for some like the government, as you said before, the government like and all these higher ups are just. I think the media and everyone else in the whole media is just trying to, I don't know, um, yes, they're trying to protect us all, uh, but are they doing it in the right way? Which is, yeah, um, it's, 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 it, this whole year sucks, but um, overall, like, think, things will get better in time. So we just have to all have faith because we're all in this together. And yeah. You there? Yeah. Made it. <laughs> I don't know why we dropped out there. I think the phone was getting too hot. It's all good. <laughs> so, uh, I'll, what, 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 uh, what were you going to say before if you continue? Can, yeah, we, well, we were just talking about COVID and how it's affected people. And I was just sort of saying, you know, I think that the thing that we've never really, we've never really, really had a, a reason outside of war to, uh, to think in terms of globally. It was funny for the first sort of few weeks or months, people were like, yeah, 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 come over. And it was like, but I can't, and, and we're all we're all in the same. And I know you've got some time off, but we're assuming because you got some time off that everyone else is free to come and join you, and how great that is. But we're all in the same. So you come over here, or let's not come over at all because we can't, or whatever it was. And I think it took a long time for people to kind of go, "Oh wait a minute, we're we're genuinely all in this together. It's not like oh yeah, yeah I've been busy. It's like we're all literally all in this together." And I just that fundamental feeling I think has been quite powerful this idea that there is without any social media without any chain letters being sent out without any group emails we're literally all connected and I 
you know, people have talked about that in a metaphysical way in the past, but we've never actually had a physical experience like this where when you stop to think about it, which takes a while, you go, we are all in the same position right now, going through the same emotional, psychological experience, potentially spiritual experience. That's quite amazing. And so I think, you know, that that's what's real right now. Returning back to the past isn't really real. That's just a way that we run our everyday lives in order to live together. But I think there's been huge parts of that that haven't been working because the machine hasn't been really very effective in terms of uh, doing anything other than just getting us to get get through the day and get by. Anyway, I'm rambling now, but I think you know what I mean. We've been You're connected. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're all good. So, for my next question, uh, if you could be in any TV or movie franchise, what would it be and why? Oh, God. God, that is a really good question. And I I don't know. I'm not very good with TV franchises or why they're TV. I could probably work towards film. I'm finding it quite hard. A bit of a block at the moment. Um... <laughs> I don't know. I'm drawing a blank on that. That's ridiculous, isn't it? But I, I'll get back to you on that. What have I been watching recently? I've been watching The Expanse recently. I probably shouldn't talk about it because it's the competition, but I, I think it's a great show. The actors are brilliant. The stylistically great. Um, been loving that. But then I was watching Succession, you know, not long before that. And Succession just had me in knots. It was, it was hilarious. So probably Succession. There you go. Phew. Managed to answer it. Awesome. So, for my very last question, uh, do you have any upcoming projects that you would like to announce on the show if there's any upcoming projects of yours? Um, no, I've been writing for, I mean, that's the practical reality of what I've been doing over the last sort of six months, really. And 10 years, I've been putting little snippets of paper in envelopes and folders. Around the place. So, I've actually got a t time to coalesce those things over the last sort of year, half year, year. And uh, I've been writing a treatment for Thomas Paine, a five-part series for Thomas Paine. So that's my, that's what I'd love to do. And I'm looking for producers on that front. So that's where I'm at with that. Um, and then I've been writing another novel, which is totally different. It's not, for, not a screenplay at all. And um, so I need to get a publisher for that. So those are, those are my focuses at the moment. That's kind of, I suppose, what's come out of not being able to just go from job to job, which I've kind of been doing fairly comfortably for the last, God, way too long. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that's what, that's what I've been doing. No, Pandora this Sunday, that's my, that's my focus at the moment. We've, uh, we've been talking about Lord of the Rings, which is happening over your neck of the woods. Um, I think next month going through till June next year. So that would be great if that comes off, but, um, yeah, I think because of the nature of COVID and all of everything, everything is slightly up in the air. But uh, Pandora season two is real out on the CW this Sunday. October 4th. There you go, everyone. <laughs> well, yeah. can I say thank you so much, Noah, for appearing on my show. It's been such a pleasure having you on my show. Uh, any last uh, final thoughts or anything that you would like to say to people? No, I mean, I, I've been following you for a long time. So I just like to say it's so nice to finally get to uh, chat to you. And uh, I'll keep following your, your gram. I, I, love your, uh, I love your work. Thank you so much. Uh, keep up the amazing work, Noah. And yeah, uh, all the best with Pandora Season 2. I'm a mythical Pandora. Sent here to judge the universe. Do you have any idea what the weapon is? It could very well be a planet killer. I would really like to go on this mission, Admiral. Imagine having the power to annihilate entire worlds, and even the stars themselves. Humanity is worth saving. What have you done? Pandora. New episodes premiere October 4th, free next day, only on the CW app.